We're about to solve problem 4.8 of the Computer Science 320 2014 Winter 2 Final Exam practice problems in a fairly complete sense and get a solution that I would be really satisfied with. But I want to warn you in advance, these are practice exam problems. And one of the lovely things for an instructor about writing practice exam problems is that you don't have to spend quite as much time on them as you spend on the real exam problems. You just come up with problems that kind of feel good, that assess the things that you're interested in, and maybe you don't even have time to work through all the detailed solutions beforehand. You just say, yeah, these will be good practice for the students. They can push on them. Even if they don't solve them, they'll practice the things they need. Well, here's the case where I got in trouble for that. Uh, I gave a problem that I thought would be kind of interesting and fun, um, but it turned out to be really, really hard. It took me quite a while to wrap my head around how to prove the answer that I thought was right for this problem. So please take the following as an opportunity to hear me work through a solution for something that was hard for me and please be aware that many 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 more minutes of working through things happened than what you actually hear me do on this problem uh, this is this is not one where i just grappled with the problem live with you i i went through solved the problem myself once or twice using all kinds of different ideas about how to approach it hitting all kinds of different dead ends and then finally came up with something that I was satisfied with. And then I walk back through it for you. So with those caveats, please proceed on ahead. But if all you ended up doing was what I described in, in the previous video to solve this problem, that's great too. We show that an efficient dynamic programming solution really does have some minimal memory usage that we can describe in a reasonable way. And in particular, what I'm going to show here is that the efficient dynamic programming solution does have memory usage that's in omega n squared, which means since we already have a solution that takes theta n squared memory, that really is our, our efficient solution. I'm going to make some assumptions here. One of the assumptions I'm going to make is that our efficient dynamic programming solution is never going to compute the solution for any given subproblem more than once. And that means once it computes a solution, it needs to keep that solution around until it's not needed anymore. And that'll be critical. There's a sense in which, if you think back to uh, our triangle, uh, let, me, let me do a, a problem with just um, a small number of cases down the diagonal. So let's say there's four cases down our diagonal here, and I'm drawing them as circles for reasons that will become clear in a moment, rather than the, the kind of step-shaped array that I did earlier. But it represents the same step-shaped array. Then there would be three cases along the next diagonal, and there would be two cases along the next diagonal, and one case on the next. And what we actually have are dependencies here. So this subproblem that's at the apex of our triangle here, it depends on everything up the column above it and everything across the row to the right of it. And similarly, the subproblem above it depends on everything up the column above it and everything along the row to the right of it. The problem above that one depends on everything above it and everything to the right of it, which isn't much anymore. Now I'll go down to the bottom one in the next column over here. That depends on everything above it and everything to the right of it. And if I go up above that, that depends on everything above it and everything to the right of it. And there's just one more to fill in. And this is messy, but it's a graph. Okay? In particular, it is a directed acyclic graph. And that means that we can do a topological sort of it. And basically, that's what we're doing when we do dynamic programming. We take this dependency graph among subproblems, and we know it's got to be a directed acyclic graph. The reason we know it's got to be a directed acyclic graph is because otherwise our recursion is going to go forever. If there's a cycle somewhere in the graph, then we've got infinite recursion. So this is a directed acyclic graph, the dependencies of subproblems on each other. And a dynamic programming solution is just one that computes the solutions in this graph in a topological ordering. And that means it always knows that it has all of the subproblems that a particular problem depends on solved before it solves that problem. Now, the extra thing we've talked about about saving memory is maybe you can throw away a bunch of the previous problems in some fashion so that the, the frontier of problems that you need to keep around at any given point is asymptotically smaller than the full set of problems. And I'm going to show that that's not true. 
that's not so, under the assumption I made earlier that I'm only going to compute a solution once. To do that, I'm going to assume we have a really large problem. So effectively, we have a triangle table. Okay. And I'm going to note that this problem here, that problem can't be thrown away. The solution to that problem can't be thrown away until everything along this horizontal line and this vertical line has also been solved. We can't throw away the solution to that problem that's circled until everything along those two lines is solved, because if we did, we just need it again. Everything along those two lines requires the solution to that problem, and so we'd recompute it. And that would violate the assumption I said earlier that we only compute the solution to a subproblem once. So that's kind of cool. I'm going to look particularly at the problems at the ends of these lines here. We're going to compute the solution to one of those two problems first. Okay, and without loss of generality, I'm going to say that we'll compute the solution to this one first. Why is that without loss of generality? Everything I'm going to argue right now, you could go back and re-argue, except assuming that we computed the other one of those two first. So you could assume that we computed the green one first instead of the yellow one. And the argument would be exactly the same. It would be symmetrical. I'm just going to assume it's the yellow one. No loss of generality because the argument is symmetrical. Okay. So if we're going to compute the yellow one first, then just before we compute the yellow one, we haven't computed solutions for anything along this line. We know we haven't because everything along that line depends on the yellow one. And we haven't computed a solution for the green one either because we said we computed the yellow one first, which means we also haven't computed solutions for anything along this line. That's kind of interesting. Additionally, we know that we have computed solutions for everything along this line. Because if we hadn't computed solutions for everything along that line, we wouldn't be ready to compute the yellow solution. The yellow solution requires a solution for everything along that line. And the fact that we've computed solutions for everything along that line, and everything that's needed for the yellow solution, means that we've computed all of the solutions in here. So that shaded space We've computed all the solutions for everything in that shaded space. Now, before I go on, how big is that shaded space? Well, I said this was right in the middle, right? So it's at n over 2, n over 2. That means this is height n over 2, and this is width n over 2 down here. That means the area of this triangle is n squared over 4. Now. I'm approximating, I'm assuming n is so large that I can treat this like triangles. I'm actually off by some lower order factor. But the point, the real point, is that that area is an element of omega n squared. In other words, it takes n squared memory if you are forced to store all the solutions in there. And I claim that you are forced to store all the solutions in there. Why? Well, you've already computed them. You don't get to throw them away until you're done with them, and you'll never need them again. But remember, we haven't computed any of the solutions along this line down here that starts with the green problem and works all the way to the apex of the triangle. And everything in the shaded area is required for at least one of the problems along that line. So at least one problem that we still have to solve requires every single element in the shaded area. And that means we've computed the shaded area, we're not done with the shaded area, we must be storing the shaded area presently. That means at some point during the process, no matter what algorithm you use, you are storing omega n squared space in solutions, in already computed solutions. So what we did earlier, the, our dynamic programming solution, it actually is an efficient solution from a memory usage standpoint. You've seen some new tools thrown at a problem. You've seen us look at a problem first as a recurrence. Then you saw us look at it as code. Then you saw us represent it as a graph and talk about topological sorts. Then you saw us look at it as an abstract geometric shape. And we were able to reason with all of those models together to come up with a pretty awesome bound. 